1965, I met a young man in a painting class at BYU. He wore a flowered shirt, a leather vest, and bell-bottom pants. His hair was probably a bit too long. He had an infectious smile, and he put you at ease within seconds. And he carried a sketchbook everywhere he went. My first glimpse into that sketchbook convinced me that the talent fairy had indeed blessed him with all the skills and ideas that I wished I had. Today that person sits on the stand ready to deliver the forum address. And gone are the flamboyant DI purchased clothes and the hair is now well within the guidelines. But the sketchbook is still by his side. And if he weren't the speaker today, I can guarantee that even as I speak, he would be adding to that sketchbook another group of strange little aeronautically challenged angels or frumpy fashion encumbered caretakers of the vegetable or animal kingdom or gravitationally unaccountable jugglers of most of our peculiar preoccupations. His ability to connect previously unconnected visual possibilities may place his work, as has been quoted, just a little left of center. But as the consummate teacher, artist, mentor, and contributor to the mission of the university, Brother James Christensen is right on target. It's an honor to introduce you to him today, Jim Christensen. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it is kind of a, an exciting moment to be here with all of you today. I wasn't sure that we were going to make it uh, as we got up this morning and saw the snowstorm and of course our street is the last street in the universe to be plowed uh, and we were digging our way out and then the windshield wiper broke off the car and I came up with the first real good cold that I've had in about a year and a half I said to my wife what else can happen and she said uh, replied to me we haven't had the big earthquake yet so, at the rate things are going, I suggest you hold on to your seats for the next hour. I do appreciate the opportunity and privilege of addressing you here. I appreciate President Bateman and those who have had confidence in me in allowing me to share a few thoughts with you today. And uh, I hope that we all can have an enjoyable morning. I had a conversation recently with a woman at a gallery that was showing my paintings and sculpture. It was typical of many such conversations of people who have seen my work. You are so lucky to have been blessed with an imagination. I have no imagination at all. I can't think up anything. This was followed by the question most frequently asked, where do you get your ideas? And that's often accompanied by golly, would I like to peek into your dreams? These comments, uh, repeated often as I talk with folks about my work, set me thinking. Where do I get my ideas? How does one think up things? Where does inspiration come from? I've never had a problem thinking things up and have since childhood had a very active imagination. But how does it work? It certainly does not come from my dreams. I have only once painted a dream, and it was only after the fact that I realized that the idea for the work had come from a dream I'd had many years before. It seems that adults see imagination and creativity as something reserved for artists, writers, and other creative types. But I don't agree with that. I believe that everyone has an imagination. Everyone has the potential to be creative. And I think that the process comes more easily to some folks. But with practice, we all have access to imagination and creative problem solving. 
no matter where our interests and talents lie. As I thought about how imagination works, I came up with the metaphor of a card catalog in a library. Now I know that most of you use byline in the library, but the cards are still there and I want you to work with me. Rows and rows of little drawers filled with thousands and thousands of little cards. And that's what our mind is like. When we're born, the catalog is filled with mostly empty slides or cards. Each card in the catalog represents a single thought or idea which is stored in our minds. We fill out the cards through our six senses. Everything that we see, touch, hear, smell, taste, sense through inspiration or intuition creates a card or a group of cards. When we're children, we fill out cards like crazy. The world is a fascinating place and we have no inhibitions about exploring and learning and experiencing. Everything in our lives feeds the card catalog. We freely experiment with ideas that we are collecting and have little problem making strange connections and unique leaps of logic. We have an entire world of images and objects and experiences to add to our catalog. First-hand experiences are best, strong and immediate. But with the explosion of technology and communication, we can access places, cultures, images, and ideas that we might never have a chance to experience firsthand. This gathering of information, this building of a card catalog, is the first requisite of imagination. The bigger our card catalog, the more potential for imaginative thinking we have. But how do we think things up? I submit that the process of imagination is nothing more than the combining of cards in your card catalog in new and unique ways. Nothing comes from nothing. Every original thought is based on information that we already have in our card catalog. Whether by a methodical process or by sheer serendipity, all new ideas come from the combination of existing concepts put together in ways that no one has ever done before. That's how imagination works. So what slows us down? Why would, we, why would that lady in the gallery say to me that she had no imagination? Here's the problem. Many of us get stuck in thinking ruts. As we grow up, we learn certain patterns of thought. We find solutions that work and which we repeat again and again. Some of these patterns are good and allow us to function. I think it's a good thing that we don't have to invent or relearn how to use silverware every time we sit down to eat. Many of the habits we have help us to get through the day efficiently. And it's good that we can do this. But unfortunately, too many of us in the routine of our lives allow too many thinking ruts to develop. And we seem to lose the ability to get out of those ruts to find original solutions. As life takes over, our imaginations atrophy like any muscle that is not exercised. After a while, many of us would echo the comment of the lady in the gallery. I don't have an imagination. My declaration to you this day is yes, you do have an imagination. Yes, you do have the capacity to dream, to invent, to create, to think things up. You just need to exercise your imagination the same way you exercise your muscles. And the more you exercise, the easier it becomes to be creative. If you find yourself fishing out of the same bucket for ideas, perhaps it's time to find a bigger bucket, or at least to put a few new fish in the bucket you have. So the first step to a richer creative thinking is to build a bigger card file. Read, travel, observe, walk, hike, have conversations with new people, make notes, listen, inhale, study, take advantage of every opportunity to add to your card catalog. And don't just add more of the same stuff. 
reach out for things that are less familiar, a little outside of your comfort zone. Be willing to take a few risks and try new things and ideas. These new cards, collected firsthand or vicariously, will trigger new thoughts and add to your creative potential. This system is not limited to visual data. The composer Kurt Bester and I have worked on a few projects together. We were sitting on the deck behind his house on the Provo River one warm summer evening a couple of years ago, planning the Evening Angels album, comparing notes on how we work and where we get our ideas. And I was talking about my card catalog when he held up his hand and said, listen. And I listened, and I heard the noise of a hundred humming, whistling, chirping, clicking, croaking critters on top of the gentle sound of the river. That's where I find my ideas. That's where I fill out my cards, Kurt said. As we listened, he began to hum and tap his fingers in an interesting rhythm, picking out the syncopated pattern of one sound on top of another. Those sounds and rhythms, he explained, become inspiration, points of departure for his music. It was fascinating for me to learn that this mu musician shared my ideas about how imagination works. The main difference in our analogies for the process is that, as he points out, being much younger and more hip than I am, he thinks of the process in terms of data stored in a computer rather than on a primitive card. He's probably right, at least about the younger part. Nor are we the originators of the idea of filling out file cards or inputting data and then combining it in original ways to imagine new ideas. While visiting a friend's studio, I found this quote tacked on his wall. It is attributed to Sir Joshua Reynolds, the 18th century English painter. It is indisputably evident that a great part of every man's life must be employed in collecting materials for the exercise of genius. Invention, strictly speaking, is little more than a new combination of those images which have been previously gathered and deposited in the memory. Nothing can come from nothing. He who has laid up no materials can produce no combinations." End of quote. And so the process takes shape and becomes a little less magical and mystical. You must train your mind to think creatively. To begin with, you must be aware of what goes on around you. Document your experiences. Keep a journal or a scrapbook. Because I think visually, my journal is a sketchbook with notes. When I travel, I make a lot of journal entries along with drawings and on-the-spot sketches. These may never turn into paintings, but they help me remember and identify new experiences. I prefer to record my impressions with drawings. But if you don't draw, write down your observations. Make notes to trigger your memory. If you don't have a way with words, augment your written observations with photo photographs to capture thoughts and impressions. I am a compulsive doodler. I draw all the time. I think that started when I was very young and my father was in the bishopric and had to sit on the stand. My mother was often ill and I went to church with my dad and had to sit alone. My dad would always give me a notepad and a pencil and tell me to be quiet and draw. It worked. I still draw in church. I listen better when I draw, and I never know when a good idea is going to present itself based on something the speaker has said. While many of the drawings in my sketchbooks are observations of people and places drawn from life, much of my sketchbook contains imaginary stuff. These drawings illustrate the idea I've been talking about of combining cards in your file in new and different and perhaps unexpected ways. Sometimes the combinations are simple transpositions of objects. Sometimes they illustrate an idea or concept that I'm trying to work out. Often, one idea leads to another. 
That's one of the fascinating things about the process of imagination. It picks up momentum and one idea leads to another. Here, for example, a drawing of a picaresque character with a peg leg led to some thoughts on early experiments with prosthetics. They hadn't quite gotten it right yet. <laughs> Many of the combinations won't work, and a lot of the ideas are only important in that they lead to other ideas that perhaps eventually lead to something that might be significant. Let me show you a couple of examples of how this process works. I love costume. I like patterns. I like the layers and textures and the busyness of certain historical periods. So I study old art, engravings, costume and design books, other historical references. I build up my catalog with lots of costume ideas and information. And then, when I do a painting, I design my own costumes based on, but not copying, the material I have studied. The result is never historically accurate, but tends to be much more interesting to me than merely copying. I'm also interested in armor. I like the shapes and the connections, the decoration and the elaboration. And whenever I travel, I try to visit a museum where they might have an armor collection. I study and draw the armor and later recreate it in my sketchbook. But the farther I get from the actual armor, the more my imagination takes over and the more unreal the drawings become. I also have a bug collection. Now, these are not scientifically important bugs. They just really look neat. And I study them and draw them and store them in my card catalog. And then when I least expect it, a drawing comes out that combines the aspects of armor and the spiny carapaces of insects. And the person sitting next to me in whatever meeting it was exclaimed, what an imagination you've got. I just sat here and watched you. You made that up. But you can see that I only sort of made it up. This can be a labored process or it, and, a, and, a, and a true struggle, or it can be as easy as falling off a log. Einstein said, as one grows older, one sees the impossibility of imposing your will on the chaos with brute force. But if you are patient, there may come that moment when, while eating an apple, the solution presents itself politely and says, here I am. In her book, Walking on Water, Madeline Lengel reminds us that while we can never predict when that moment of true inspiration will come, we must work constantly to be ready when that magic moment presents itself and be prepared to recognize it and take advantage of it. I believe we can make these creative connections best when our minds are allowed to meander a little, when we are not assailed with the myriad of messages and concerns of everyday life. How many of us get great ideas in the shower or on walks? I find that I think of solutions to problems, write the best talks, get the best ideas for paintings, in that twilight half-awake state between sleep and wakefulness in the morning. If I've gone to bed thinking about a painting I'm trying to finish or begin and go to sleep thinking about it, I often find possible solutions as I awaken in the morning. Sometimes I will set my alarm a half hour before I have to get up so that I can doze and think and dream and ponder the possibilities of potential solutions. Faculty meetings in church sometimes provide the same opportunity. <laughs> May I take a moment here for a parenthetical insertion, which is also a major plug for the arts, and I hope that all the administrators at this university are listening. In addition to the pure enjoyment and delight offered by the musical, theatrical, literary, and visual arts, they are the gymnasium of the imagination. The fine arts not only offer limitless new cards for our files, 
but stimulate us to make new combinations, to puzzle out meanings, and to exercise our what-if muscles. Sometimes art suggests answers, presents information in new ways or from a different point of view. Sometimes it frames or defines a problem while offering insights into other people's explorations that we can use as points of departure for our own creative thinking. The arts are not dessert after a serious technological real-life meal, but are an important course in a well-balanced intellectual diet. One of my goals as a visual artist is to provide the exercise equipment for others to strengthen their imaginations. While much of my work has specific meaning and direction for me, I enjoy painting works that do not necessarily explain themselves. And I do not insist that the viewer divine my exact meaning for a given work. Each of you, looking at one of my paintings, will bring a unique set of life experiences, a head full of cards that you have filled out over a lifetime. We will have some cards in common, but your experiences will have given you very different cards than mine. And with a little effort, you will find that your own work, or you will find your own meaning in my work that is valid for you and much more important for your life than my meanings. If it is of primary importance for me to communicate a specific message or, or feeling with my work of art, then it's my responsibility to give you the clues, allow you access to the meaning of the work. The beauty of most art is that it allows more than one interpretation based on the experience of the viewer. I've often told the story of how this idea was sent home to me when I was talking to a group of second or third graders. I had talked to them about trusting themselves to interpret art, to find meaning for themselves and not worry too much about what the artist intended. <clears throat> I had showed them this painting entitled, Lawrence Pretended Not to Notice That a Bear Had Become Attached to His Coattail. <laughs> I painted this work at a time in my life when I was faced with adversity, and I was coming to terms with how I was handling it. This character emerged in my sketchbook and gave me much food for thought. As a print, I found that many people identified with Lawrence, and the smile that it brought helped them to face their own problems. But when I asked the school children what they thought the painting was about, a very anxious, pigtailed little moppet responded enthusiastically, you should never take pets home to your bob without asking. <laughs> and that is exactly what that painting was about. For that little girl with her set of cards, that painting carried a message that was much more significant to her than any of my metaphorical thinking about dealing with problems. By playing with ideas and imagination through art or writing or telling stories or playing games or creative daydreaming, we increase our ability to think things up. I suspect that most of you have played the game at some time or another where one person starts a story, takes it so far, and then passes it on to the next person at a strategic moment. It's a lot of fun and very unexpected turns of events happen as we exercise our imaginations. I taught art at a junior high school in California for a few years after college. And one of the assignments to stretch the imagination of my students was 101 things to do with an alligator. We would brainstorm the 100 plus uses for alligators, record the ideas, and then illustrate them. It has always been interesting to watch the students go at it. First, we would do the obvious, from shoes to handbags. And then we would get a little creative and uh, put them in a James Bond movie or in some kind of showbiz. But after 15 or 20 suggestions, everything slowed down. And then someone would come up with some wacky idea about making skis out of alligators or entering one in a beauty contest, and the momentum picked up. 
And once the students got the idea that any combination of cards was possible and acceptable, their minds opened up and we couldn't write down the possibilities fast enough. But even by junior high school, these students had to push themselves through the process and give themselves permission to get a little crazy and off the wall in order to relearn how to make things up. It is hard work to start up an engine that hasn't run in years. It's hard to develop a workout routine if you haven't exercised in a long time. But the benefits of exercise and conditioning are obvious and almost immediate whether we are conditioning our bodies or our imaginations. Imagination is available to everyone. We can all be creative if we are willing to pay the price, as there is a price to be paid for any success. We must study and observe. We must be willing to experiment. We must allow ourselves to be comfortable with flights of fancy and exploratory thinking. We must move out of our comfort zone into un the unknown territory of what if. We all have the ability to imagine. We all have the potential to extend our thinking limits, to get out of our thinking ruts, to create. For are we not made in the image of the greatest creator of all? It is my hope and prayer that we can each find and exercise our creative potential. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.